Well, my name is Sarah Alger, and I'm the director of the Russell Museum, and so thrilled to be um, co-hosting this event today with Dr. Suzanne Coben, who is a primary care physician here at Mass General, and she's also the director of the Writer in Residence program here. Uh, and this is that program's inaugural event. We're very th thrilled to, to have everyone here, and with that, we'll turn it over to Dr. Coben. Uh, welcome everyone, both here uh, and uh, watching on uh, Facebook Live. Um, it's uh, such a pleasure to welcome you to Poetry at Work uh, in celebration of National Poetry Month. Now perhaps you think it's a little bit strange that a hospital should have a celebration of National Poetry Month. And perhaps you think it's even stranger that a hospital has a writer in residence. But it's not so strange because though this is, this place is many things, it's the best hospital in the world, it's a premier research institution, but I think most of all it's a place where important words are spoken every hour of every day. A woman waits for her biopsy results. A family member is comforted by a nurse in the hall in the middle of the night. A medical student is confused about what to do next and taken in hand by an intern. In all of these incidents, words are very powerful. And though we have the most sophisticated technology in the world and the most advanced therapeutics, there's nothing we have so powerful as all words. And so what uh, more appropriate than for us to uh, celebrate words through this event and I hope through uh, many more events just so that uh, you know, the Writer in Residence uh, program uh, was initially established uh, four years ago in the Division of General Internal Medicine uh, with the support of Drs. Joshua Metley and Mary McNaughton Collins. And just this past January uh, was expanded hospital-wide with the support of our president, Dr. Peter Slavin. Uh, check out our Apollo site or email me personally. Uh, we provide coaching and mentoring for uh, hospital staff interested in narrative writing, uh, facilitate reading discussion groups for administrative and clinical teams, uh, and we're always open to ideas about community events such as this. So uh, I'd like to um, uh, introduce our speakers in groups of three, uh, uh, grouped somewhat thematically. Uh, we're starting with the theme of beauty amid suffering, which I think is uh, resonant for anyone who works in this hospital. We see incredible creativity and beauty uh, amid uh, the greatest suffering. Uh, first, we'll hear from Dr. Robert Goldstein. Uh, Robbie earned his uh, MD and PhD at Tufts and completed his medical training here at MGH where he served as chief medical resident. He's now an infectious disease specialist and a beloved member of the Department of Medicine. Uh, last summer, uh, he helped co-found and now directs the new transgender health program at Mass General. And uh, since he's known for his incredible devotion to his patients, it was not surprising that when I invited him to share a poem, uh, he decided to share a poem by one of his patients. We'll next hear from Faith Wilcox, who is the owner of uh, Faith Wilcox Narratives. She also serves on the Family Advisory Council of the Mass General Hospital for Children. 
And in 2019, she started a volunteer journal writing program for families of pediatric patients and also for adolescent patients. She's a writer herself and completed a memoir, Chasing Hope, about her experience uh, with uh, her 14-year-old daughter, Elizabeth's battle with osteosarcoma, for which she was treated here uh, at Mass General. And then last in this group, we're very honored to welcome Daniel Johnson. He's a poet, an educator, uh, and the executive director of Mass Poetry. He also was the founding executive director of 826 Boston's Youth Writing Center in Roxbury for nearly a decade uh, and helped to de deliver a writing program there to more than 20,000 underserved Boston public school students. He's the author of a book of poems, How to Catch a Falling Knife, uh, and um, most recently, you may have read about him in the Boston Globe. Uh, he is the poet uh, who wrote the inscription for the forthcoming Boston Marathon Memorial, and he'll be sharing with us a preview of the memorial today. Thanks for having me. Um, I have to say I was a little bit at a loss about picking a poem. I usually stand up here and talk about medical cases uh, and research, but um, I think ultimately I decided that this was about storytelling and this is about moments in medicine that really move us. And um, I actually discussed this event with a patient of mine who I got permission to use his name and um, information about him. Um, he was diagnosed with HIV in 1996, and after that he began writing poetry. And he told me that he thought with his diagnosis he lost everything in his life. And when he started writing, writing poetry, he realized he had something. He was able to bring something back. And he lived through the poems that he wrote. He writes mostly for himself, although he's published a few things. He has a couple of books um, and um, compilations of his poetry. And he helped me look through all of his poems and find one that felt right. And I think it ultimately ended up being a story of hope and optimism and particularly of strength that he exhibits. And he reminds me of something that I've been thinking about a lot with my patients, especially in the trans health program, which is a phrase that courage is not the absence of fear, it's knowing that there's something much more important. And so I'd like to share with you a poem by Mark Russell entitled, What If? What if you woke up and the world was just kind? Would you just stay the same or would it change your mind? What if you thought that dreams could come true would you just get confused and then not know what to do? What if the world was just filled with love? Would you drop to your knees, thank heaven above? What if happiness lived in every man's heart? Would it pull us together or tear us apart? What if you heard all the words that were said? Would you understand or will they go over your head? What if you saw for the very first time? Would you take what was yours, leave what was mine? What if time just stopped and simply stood still? Would the killing just stop, the blood wouldn't spill? What if the world could relinquish all of its fears? Would you try to understand, maybe shed a couple tears? What if it felt like the end was quite near? Would you just let it crash or grab the wheel to steer? What if you knew just what was felt? Would you keep all the cards in the hand you were dealt? What if the world could finally be filled with peace? Would the killing just stop, the violence just cease? What if you saw that dreams can come true? They just live in your heart, it's all up to you. What if the world was just filled with hope? Would you just hang your head or learn how to cope? It's easy to see what answers can be true. Just understand that it's all up to you. Thank you.
received excellent care and innovative care and um, great, great amounts of kindness. But she did die after one year, uh, 365 days to be exact after her diagnosis. Uh, now I volunteer at Mass General Hospital for Children. Um, I started the journaling program there recently and I'm uh, hoping in my small way that I can, sure, that I can um, contribute to helping families um, as they struggle here with tremendous amount of stressors that they're facing and also great hope that can come about by being cared for here as well. I wrote a book of poetry called Facing Into the Wind. I started journaling when my daughter was ill and it was a way that I was able to express what was really trapped inside, many things that I just never wanted to say aloud. I continue to journal to this day and it's helped me greatly in the grieving and healing process. I chose this poem called The Welcoming Mom because of the fundamental truths um, in it. Um, and what I hope that you will be able to read into it is that illness cannot take away joy, death cannot take away love, and death cannot never steal away memories. A welcoming balm. We are sitting happily and easily, I on the floor with a cushion behind my back, and Elizabeth in her bed with pillows behind her back. She's styling her short hair and looking into a mirror. She says that she looks like a boy with her big almond-shaped hazel eyes and her long dark glasses, lashes. She's exquisite. Her eyes sparkle on good days. Good days do not happen very often. Good moments do happen. Large bulging tumors protrude on the right side of her neck. Alien growths numb her chest and underarms. Today she's easy. She wants to be a model. She's daydreaming about modeling in front of the mirror. How long is my hair? A question she frequently asks since her treatments. About two and a half inches, I respond. Plastic tubes throw oxygen into her nose. The oxygen machine rattles nearby. The late summer light is beautiful and soft on the trees outside. The air is a welcoming balm. Can this time of year last forever? Can this peaceful afternoon never end? Can Elizabeth's health stay the same and not worsen? Can we just call it a day? and no more tumors grow. If I drew a picture of happiness, this would be it. Elizabeth lying on her bed, looking at magazines and chatting with me. Me sitting comfortably and chatting with Liz. The weather is warm and the light is beautiful. Mommy, will you paint my toenails? Yes, son. by Jane Kenyon. I got out of bed on two strong legs. It might have been otherwise. I ate cereal, sweet milk, ripe, flawless peach. It might have been otherwise. I took the dog uphill to the birch wood. All morning I did the work I love. At noon I lay down with my mate. It might have been otherwise. We ate dinner together at a table with silver candlesticks. It might have been otherwise. I had slept in a bed in a room with paintings on the walls and planned another day just like this day. But one day I know it will be otherwise. 
I love how this quiet poem celebrates and praises the ordinary, rising from bed, dining with a spouse, while repeatedly intoning that change will come, it always comes, sometimes shatteringly so. I'm Daniel Johnson, Executive Director of Mass Poetry, a nonprofit that promotes poetry in Boston and across Massachusetts. Each year we host the Massachusetts Poetry Festival, and this school year, this school year we'll reach 3,500 students with our programs in Boston and across Massachusetts. Today I'd like to talk briefly about drafting the lines of poetry for the Boston Marathon bombing memorials. First I'll begin with a story. I remember cradling in my arms Chuku Eluka, or Luca as we call him for short. Ebele, my wife, gave birth at Brigham and Women's Hospital on April 14, 2013 to an eight pound, nine ounce baby boy whose name in Igbo means, God has done something wonderful. The following day, Abel and I held Luca. We held each other, exhausted, exhilarated. We took turns sleeping and waking. I remember even penning a few lines in my journal as Abel and Luca slept in the hospital bed, bathed in daylight. I still savor the hush of that moment. It was then I heard a code orange announced over the hospital intercom. Moments later, it repeated. Shortly after, text messages started pouring in from friends. Are you guys okay? Sending love from NYC. Just heard the terrible news. I, I turned on the TV. On national news, we saw smoke billowing from the finish line of the Boston Marathon. I moved to the window to look toward Boylston Street. Within minutes, we decided to leave the hospital. I wheeled Abella out of the newborn ward with Luca in her arms. When we reached the front door, we passed Humvees and Army National Guard members clutching loaded machine guns. Helicopters hovered, TV vans blinkered at the curb. April 15th, 2013 marks a day of great joy and great pain for my wife and me. It also remains the day when the 117th running of the Boston Marathon became otherwise. For me, the Boston Marathon bombing parallels another act of terrorism that altered my life forever. For my wife and me and many of our friends, there's life before August 19th, 2014, and life after. On that date, I lost my closest friend, Godfather Toluca, the friend who introduced my wife and me in a blizzard. That friend was conflict journalist James Foley, who died after nearly two year captivity in Syria. He was beheaded by ISIS in August 2014. James' grisly execution, like the Boston Marathon bombing, traumatized our nation. It blew a hole in my life and the lives of so many around me. Yet I know that poetry played a vital role in helping me to reorient, find my way, and chart those burning waters. In the wake of these twin tragedies, the city of Boston tapped me to write lines of poetry to honor the three victims who died when pressure cooker bombs exploded near the finish line. These lines would be engraved in bronze, encircle two granite memorials sculpted by Pablo Eduardo. These rough hewn, I'm gonna bring up a couple images if I can. Sorry, well, I'll, I'll continue as we, uh, pardon, pardon the interruption. Uh, so the, the two markers will stand on each side of Boylston Street. Um, when tapped for this task, uh, sorry, I'm 
to just leave that address. We work in Fort Perth, as you know. Uh, we tapped for this task. I was nervous at first, almost paralyzingly so, yet I returned again and again to the belief that poetry like medicine can be a salve for the psyche, a balm for the traumatized. The first marker, which is placed where the first bomb exploded, killing Crystal Campbell, age 29, reads as follows. All we have lost is brightly lost. It's an admission that loss can be blinding in total, but it also calls out the collective nature of our grief work. And the second marker placed at the site where the other bomb detonated, killing Martin Richard, age eight, and Lu Ling Si, age 23, reads as follows. Let us climb now the road to hope. The two lines together read as, all we have lost is brightly lost. Let us climb now the road to hope. It's impossible to return to the days before the bombing. Now and forever, it will always be otherwise. Still, it's my hope these lines and the larger memorial help to reclaim the, these sites and allow us all to move step by step from ruin to hope. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Robbie, Faith, and Daniel. Uh, next, uh, we'll hear about the solace of words in many, many ways that words can provide comfort, amusement, clarification. We'll first hear from Anna Pandolfo. She's a translation specialist at Mass General. She translates written texts in Spanish, into Spanish. Uh, to give you a sense of what an enormous job this is, um, in our uh, community health centers, uh, we have about one third of the patients uh, primarily Spanish speaking. That's the largest percentage uh, of any health facility in the area. I know that she is both humble and passionate about translation because when she sent me the poem she's going to read for us in Spanish and English, she wrote, on the bottom of the English version, I'm not finished. Translation is never finished. <laughs> Next, uh, Debbie Burke uh, is the Senior Vice President for Patient Care and Chief Nurse at MGH. She has responsibility for advancing <coughs> clinical practice, research, education, community service, and oversight for a staff of 5,600 nurses, health professionals, and support personnel. She also, as you're going to learn, as I learn, has a really good sense of humor. <laughs> and then next in this group is Carmen Vega Barakowitz. Uh, Carmen is the director of the departments of the speech, language, swallowing, reading disabilities, chaplaincy, medical interpreters at Mass General. Uh, and um, she has been named a diversity cha champion by the American Speech and Hearing Association and has earned the Partners in Excellence Award uh, too many times to count. Mm -hmm. in 1963 at the age of 62. 
And while he was in exile, he Cernuda spent a few years in New England and was a lecturer at Mount Holyoke College here in South Cape May, Massachusetts. His literary work was not recognized or well received among his contemporaries, in part because of his views and lifestyle, which didn't conform to the intellectual, moral, or cultural climate of the time. Uh, we'll read the poem by Sonura first in Spanish and then my attempt to translate in English. No decía palabras. No decía palabras. Acercaba tan solo un cuerpo interrogante porque ignoraba que el deseo es una pregunta cuya respuesta no existe. Una hoja cuya rama no existe un mundo cuyo cielo no existe. La angustia se abre paso entre los huesos, remonta por las venas hasta abrirse en la piel. Surtidores de sueño, hecho carne e interrogación vuelta a las nubes. Un roce al paso, una mirada fugaz entre las sombras, basta para que el cuerpo se abra en dos, ávido de recibir en sí mismo otro cuerpo que sueñe mitad y mitad, sueño y sueño, carne y carne, iguales en figura, iguales en amor, iguales en deseo, aunque solo sea una esperanza, porque el deseo es una pregunta cuya respuesta nadie sabe. He didn't say words by Luis Cernuda. He didn't say words merely approaching a questioning body, not knowing that desire is a question whose answer does not exist, a leaf whose branch does not exist, a world whose heaven does not exist. Anguish makes his way through the bone, rushes through the veins, exudes through the skin. Stream of dreams become flesh in the inquiry to return to the sky. Passing brush, a brief glance among the shadows, are enough to unfold the body in two, added to receive in itself another dreaming body, half and half, dream and dream, flesh to flesh, symmetrical in shape, in love, in desire, even if this were only a hope, because desire is a question whose answer no one knows. Like many other poets, Cernuda, through his writing, had the ability to capture and evoke thoughts and sentiments that are timeless and universal, yet, and at the same time, so intimate, private, and personal to the reader. In Cernuda poems, body and mind are intertwined. Alongside the body's physical needs, humankind possesses a symbolic ability which infuses another dimension to our experiences. This symbolic ability doesn't evolve in isolation. It needs to interact with others to acquire meaning. And it is within that space that desire emerges. Unlike physiological needs that can be satisfied, desire remains unfulfilled and questions us with repetitive insistence acting as an engine that drives us to search for answers. The questioning of that desire sometimes tragically drives the individual towards self-destructive paths, such as addiction and relapse, patterns of abuse and violence, or on a large scale, this is with the sustained tyranny of dictatorial regime. But the questioning of that desire can also take that, the individual to explore a more constructive path to self-actualization. Therefore, we search for answers in faith, in science, in social justice, in exile, in interest groups, in our relationship with the terrorists. There is nothing more anxiety-provoking 
that not having an answer to our questions. When society imposes intransigent rules and restrictions that limit our potential and our desire, it forces us to pigeonhole individuals into arbitrary categories, or else be considered an outcast. To conclude, it would be naive on my part to expect that society and its institutions would answer all those questions for us. But at least society should allow individuals the freedom to be inquisitive by opening opportunities to explore in a safe and compassionate, respectful, inclusive, and nurturing environment. sharing with you a selection of haikus. So why haikus? So I'm in the third grade learning about what a haiku is and my teacher has a contest to who is going to award someone who writes the best haiku. So I won that contest <laughs> and my reward was I actually got to eat a hot fudge sundae during class. <laughs> so thus began my interest in the haiku. Um, but I've grown in my appreciation for what this very small poem has to offer and how meaningful a short poem can be. And for those of you who may not remember what a haiku is, it's a poem of 17 syllables. The first syllable is five, second line is seven syllables, and the third line is again five syllables. So I'm gonna read a selection of haikus for you from poets who live in some of my favorite places. And you'll see that they've drawn uh, meaning from the places that they live in their haikus. Michael West from Martha's Vineyard. The praying mantis copulates, then eats her mate. Nothing personal. <laughs> <laughs> Calvin Olson from Boston. Italian sausage, grand slam over green monster. Voice hoarse from screaming. Francis Harvey from Ireland. The wind and the rain, the wind and the rain again, and again, Ireland. <laughs> and finally, the award-winning haiku from third grader Debbie Byrne. <laughs> Pat was a good girl, got many things for Christmas. It sure did pay off. <laughs> diverge in a yellow wood. I'm sorry I could not travel both. And be one traveler, long I stood, and looked down one as far as I could to where it bent in the undergrowth. Then took the other, as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear though as for what that, the passing there had warned them really about the same. And both that morning equally lay in leaves no step had trodden black. Oh, I kept the first for another day. Yet knowing how way leads unto way, I doubted if I should ever come back. I shall be telling this with a sigh, somewhere, ages and ages hence, two roads diverge in a wood, and I, I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. So 
So I was born and raised in Puerto Rico. And when I was in middle school and in high school, I spent many summers and weekends camping with friends. My friends and I were very close. We were Girl Scouts and we belonged to the same troop, even though we came from different neighborhoods. As we grew older, we went our separate ways, but we remained in contact for many years. One day, when I was still living in Puerto Rico, I received a letter from one of them, my friend Gloria. She was living in Minnesota, and she had met a lovely man. He was Muslim, and she had converted to Islam from Catholicism. She ended her letter with the following stanza. I shall be telling this with a sigh. Somewhere, ages and ages hence, two roads diverge in a wood, and I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. This was the late 70s. She had left Puerto Rico, was living in Minnesota, had adopted a new community and a new religion. She dressed differently. She was wearing a jihad. It was the first time I had encountered someone, and this someone was my friend, who had made a significant life-changing decision. I still recall how helpful it was to process and understand her decision through this stanza. This point helped me to see the thoughtfulness and the intentionality of important decisions. She had chosen the road less traveled by. Many times since, I have wrestled with choices, and I too have chosen roads less traveled by. There have been risks and worries, but in the end, the paths I have chosen are invariably consistent with my values and beliefs. Life will bring us to different crossroads, and the road one chooses, that will make all the difference. and at the most unexpected times. Uh, what the poet Tom Gunn called moments of poetry and what his friend, the neurologist writer uh, Oliver Sacks, borrowed and called moments of poetry in the exam room. Um, first, we'll hear from Gordia Bannister who is the executive director of the Institute for Patient Care at Mass General and the director of the Yvonne L. Mott Center for Nursing Research. Her mission is to promote diverse workforce to provide medical care for a population of patients growing in diversity. She hails from Casper, Wyoming. And uh, among the many marks of her success, uh, in her mission to promote diversity is that Dr. Bannister was the recipient of the American Nurses Association Mary Mahoney Award, which recognizes individuals for advancing equal opportunity for minorities in nursing. Next, we'll be hearing from Dr. Peter Slavin, our boss. <laughs> um, and to whom I really have to give just a second special thanks. Uh, I was just reminiscing with Debbie and Dr. Slavin about the day uh, I made an appointment uh, to come talk to him about this um, half-baked crazy idea I had about um, bringing literature to the whole hospital. And he said, that sounds good, let's do it. And uh, I just feel very, very lucky uh, to work in a place where that was the response. 
response to that particular idea. It's unique and um, I'm very grateful. Uh, he's been the president of Mass General since 2003. Uh, before that, he served as chairman and CEO of the NGPO. And before that, he was president of Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis. And before that, he was a senior VP and a chief medical officer uh, at Mass General. He's a graduate of Harvard College and Harvard Medical School and Harvard Business School, and he did his medical training uh, at uh, Mass General. And then finally, uh, the last word goes to Rabbi Ben Langton. Uh, I was fascinated to see that he received uh, a BA in theater studies and philosophy from Yale before his rabbinic ordination with a major in Talmud from the Jewish Theological Seminary. In uh, reading up a little bit on uh, Rabbi uh, Ben, I was uh, fascinated to see the, uh, the variety of activities he's been involved in here uh, at Mass General. He serves as an ambassador uh, for uh, MGH Men Against Abuse, uh, which is an initiative through our Haven program. He's a really good writer, and around this time of year, he's been known to break out his Red Sox yarmulke. <laughs> so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you. So I'm gonna read the poem, Praise Song for the Day, by Elizabeth Alexander. And I selected this poem for three reasons. First of all, it was the poem that was read for Barack Obama's presidential inauguration. But no matter what your political persuasion may be, I have to tell you, I was there and being surrounded by thousands and thousands of thousands of people, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, young, old, thin, larger. It was an amazing, possible, positive, wonderful experience to be with so many people that were so elated and so happy. The second reason I chose this poem is because of my parents. My parents grew up in the segregated South in New Orleans, Louisiana. There were very, very few opportunities at that time for my parents. And as it was said earlier in my introduction, I was raised in Casper, Wyoming. My parents made the brave decision to move from Louisiana to Casper to a place they had never been before. And they tell the story frequently of moving there in the wintertime in January, which was not a good decision <laughs> on their part. But they were standing on the shoulders of others of their ancestors and the work that our ancestors had done to get to the place where they were and to the place where I am today, which would not have been possible without them. And then the last reason that I selected this poem is I've been in a number of settings recently where there's been a discussion about hate and that it feels like there's so much hatred around us. And I believe this poem ends with hope, with love, with opportunity, and hopefully a light for our future. So again, the name of this poem is Praise Song for the Day. Each day we go about our business, walking past each other, catching each other's eyes or not, about to speak or speaking. All about us is noise. All about us is noise and bramble, thorn and den, each one of our ancestors on our tongues. Someone is stitching up a hem, darning a hole in a uniform, patching a tire, repairing the things in need of repair. Someone is trying to make music somewhere with a pair of wooden spoons on an oil drum with cello, boombox, harmonica, or voice. 
A woman and her son wait for the bus. A farmer considers the changing sky. A teacher says, take out your pencils, begin. We encounter each other in words, words spiny and smooth, whispered or disclaimed, words to consider, to reconsider. We've crossed dirt roads and highways that mark the will of someone and then others who said, I need to see what's on the other side. I know there's something better down the road. We need to find a place where we are safe. We walk into that which we cannot yet see. Say it plain that many have died for this day. Sing the names of the dead who brought us here, who laid the train tracks, raised the bridges, picked the cotton and the lettuce, built brick by brick the glittering edifices that would keep them clean and work inside of. Praise song for the struggle. Praise song for the day. Praise song for every hand-lettered sign, the figuring it out at kitchen tables. Some live by love thy neighbor as thyself. Others by first do no harm or take no more than you need. What if the mightiest word is love? Love beyond marital, filial, national. Love that casts a widening pool of light. Love with no need to preempt grievance. In today's sharp sparkle, this winter air, anything can be made, any sentence begun. On the brink, on the brim, on the cusp. Praise song for walking forward in that light. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, for being here. And I want to thank uh, Sarah Alger, the director of the museum, and uh, Suzanne Coven, our writer and resident together this uh, program and for inviting me to uh, participate. I think everyone here at Mass General Hospital knows that the work that we do uh, at its very core is about a group of people, caregivers, who uh, spend a lot of time uh, developing a body of, of knowledge, learning that body of knowledge, and then selflessly applying it to, in, the, in an effort to improve the, uh, the welfare of the lives of other human beings. Uh, that opportunity to make a difference in the lives of other people is really what draws almost everyone in healthcare into this field. Now, there have been many uh, authors over the years who have uh, written eloquently about that uh, very sacred work that we do. I just briefly want to uh, read uh, four pieces of prose that I think do that very nicely. One it was by Dr. Francis Peabody, who actually served on the staff of this hospital, was a uh, renowned Boston physician. And in 1927, uh, wrote, and I believe this is on the wall of the White Lobby, that the secret of the care of the patient is in caring for the patient. Uh, Mort Swartz, a le legendary physician on our medical service, who uh, died uh, just within the last few years, said to generations of our trainees on the medical service, myself included, that patients don't care what you know until they know that you care. Uh, Gavin Francis, a Scottish physician, uh, recently wrote that medicine is an alloy of science and kindness. And Ken Schwartz, who was a patient at this hospital, a friend of mine and my wife's, and the spouse of Ellen Cohen, who used to be a social worker on Bigelow Six, uh, uh, wrote this in the Boston Globe magazine back in 1995. Until last fall, I had spent a considerable part of my career as a healthcare lawyer first in state government and then in the private sector. I came to know a lot about healthcare policy and management, government regulations and contracts, but I knew little about the delivery of care. All that changed on November 7, 1994, when at age 40, I was diagnosed with advanced lung cancer. In the months that followed, I was subjected to chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, and news of all kinds, most of it bad. And yet the ordeal has been punctuated by moments of exquisite compassion. 
I have been the recipient of an extraordinary array of human and humane responses to my plight. These acts of kindness, the simple human touch for my caregivers, have made the unbearable bearable. I, I will never forget uh, sitting at home on Sunday morning and opening that uh, Sunday Globe magazine in 1995 and reading that piece. I still think it's probably the best uh, piece uh, ever written by a uh, patient uh, expressing the, the impact that uh, care has had on, on their uh, horrible ordeal. Uh, and, uh, and fortunately, uh, Ken's family and friends established the Schwartz Center, which is now one of uh, many programs that we have here at Mass General aiming to make sure that we keep the care in healthcare. There are obviously a lot of forces in our society that are trying to squeeze the care out of healthcare. We, ought, we need to push back uh, firmly in the other direction and certainly the Schwartz Center has been wonderful here and across the country doing that and I'm also hopeful that this writer in residency program under Suzanne's uh, leadership will, will do the same. Uh, so I'm going to now turn to my piece of uh, poetry, which was uh, written by a gentleman by the name of Alberto Rios, who was born in 1952. He grew up along the Arizona-Mexico border and has gone on to become a pro prolific uh, poet. In 1981, he received the Walt Whitman Award, and he currently serves as Chancellor of the Academy of American Poets, and he is also the inaugural Poet Laureate of the State of Arizona. Uh, Suzanne was the one who shared this uh, poem with me a few, few months ago for a, a different reading that I was uh, had asked to do, uh, but I thought it was appropriate to read it again uh, today. Uh, and what I like so much about it is that I think it captures in poetry the same spirit that uh, I mentioned in, in prose. Uh, it talks of, uh, very simply and eloquently about how um, caring, giving it involves uh, two people who are initially strangers, ultimately coming together in the case of healthcare and often intimate relationships if things go well. That giving is a very personal uh, thing that we engage in, that it can be transformative, that it never becomes uh, tiresome for either the person who gives or the recipient, and that maybe the most powerful uh, form of giving is not the sharing of one's strengths, but the sharing of one's vulnerability. So with that as background, the, the poem is entitled When Giving is All We Have by Alberto Rios. One river gives its journey to the next. We give because someone gave to us. We give because nobody gave to us. We give because giving has changed us. We give because giving could have changed us. We have been better for it. We have been wounded by it. Giving has many faces. It is loud and quiet, big though small, diamond in wood nails. Its story is old, the plot worn, and the pages too, but we read this book anyway, over and again. Giving is first and every time, hand to hand, mine to yours, yours to mine. You gave me blue, and I gave you yellow. Together we are simple green. You gave me what you did not have, and I gave you what I had to give. Together we made something greater from the difference. Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Dr. Hubbard, for inviting me to be part of this. <clears throat> I've been a uh, spiritual care provider now for my 17th year here at MGH. I've been called to the bedside of a deceased Jewish patient more than a few dozen times in my years at MGH. After offering my condolences and providing immediate spiritual support, the family usually asks, if we should say a prayer. I say yes, and the prayer I say is called by its first few words, El Malay Rachamim, God full of mercy. The text asks God, full of mercy, to show mercy to the soul of the deceased and to the bereaved. Long before I became a rabbi, in my sophomore year of college, my modern Hebrew professor, Miri Kabobi, introduced me to Yehuda Amichai's brief, brilliant, ironic poem, El Malay Rachamim, God Full of Mercy, which turns the traditional prayer 
on its head. I'll read it in Hebrew and English. El male rachamim, il male ha el male rachamim, hayu rachamim ba'olam, below rock bow. Ani shekatavti brachim bahar, bihistakalti el kol ha mekim, ani shehebeti gibiyot mina gubaot, yodel saper sha'olam, rek me rachamim. Anisha Iti Melach Melach Liad Hayam, Shamanati Bli Haklata Mul Halomi, Shasafarti Tsade Malachim, Shalibi Herim Mishkolot Keev, Betach Riot Noraot, Anisha Mishtamesh Rak Bechela Katan, Minhal Milim Bamalon, Anisha Muchrach Liftor Chedot Bal Korhi, Yodea ki il mole ha el mole rachamim hayu ha rachamim ba'olam velo rakbo. God full of mercy. If only God were not full of mercy, there would be mercy in the world and not just in God. I who plucked flowers on the mountain who gazed out over all the valleys, I who brought corpses from the hilltops, I can tell you that the world is void of mercy. I who was the king of salt beside the sea, who stood against my will before my window, who counted the footsteps of angels, whose heart lifted weights of anguish in dreadful contests, I who use but a tiny portion of the words in the dictionary. I who am forced to decipher riddles. I know that if only God were not full of mercy, there would be mercy in the world and not just in God. Amitai uses several clever devices to subvert the expected meanings of phrases in the poem. The phrase, king of salt beside the sea, has the resonance in Hebrew of being the king of nothing, since the salt sea is the Hebrew term for the Dead Sea, one of the lowest and most arid points on earth. The irony is obvious of a poet who only uses a few words, which in Hebrew is the milim babalot, words in the word book. But the most profound impact this poem has on me personally is the idea that God being full of mercy doesn't mean that God dispenses mercy. Amichai suggests that somehow we've got it all wrong and that God is, well, hogging all the mercy. He is unapologetically suggesting that a cosmic error got made somewhere and God ended up with all the mercy, with none left over for the world. I want to reassure everyone here that, unlike once happened at an Israeli soldier's funeral, I read the prayer, not the poem. And I do believe that God has some mercy left over for the world below. But since I was exposed to Amichai's satire, years before I learned the traditional text, a small part of me will always wink at God through the tradition with the twinkling of the eye that the poem teaches. I dedicate my teaching today to Lori Kay of blessed memory, who was killed this past Shabbat morning, protecting the life of her rabbi.